together several years ago, passed along to Brian Bean, who texted us today. He's doing well. Aaron Brandt contributed to this last year as well. So some of it will seem familiar. Um, on the Posna website, so Posna Academy, they have some videos and stuff on there. There is a, a review by a gentleman by the name of Dan Miller, who's in uh, Minnesota, who's put together a couple talks. You know, they're about 40 minutes each, but he's added some content to them, and they're worth reviewing as well if people have an interest or need to go through some other PEDS topics as well. But again, we're going to try to cover sort of the high yield uh, topics here. So um, again, you know, a lot of the stuff that does get tested does gets repeated time after time and the common things being trauma as well as some sports questions and other things uh, and injuries. And um, so we'll, and, and some of the, um, you know, non-accidental trauma, you know, pops up fairly frequently, but and some of the rare diseases as uh, skeletal dysplasias, other things like that are sort of testable in the basic science or, or PEDS world there. All right. And so we'll, I guess some of these have sort of, uh, if you're on these, these are on the Dropbox. They have questions behind these as well. For this, we've just presented the content and hid the questions there. So we'll get started in upper extremity trauma. I know Dr. Scannell and Dr. Palowski are on. If after sort of the end of this section, we want to go through some highlights from the different uh, trauma sections, we can do this there. Um, lower extremity, I'm going to go fairly quickly through maybe cover. Dr. Uh, Clark gave a great talk last week that covered a lot of the stuff as I went through this as well. But we'll, we'll get started and uh, go from there. So um, we'll start first with uh, the clavicle. OK, um, yeah, I think the thing to know about clavicles, um, intramembranous ossification, first bone to ossify, the lateral physis closes up to 18 and the last physis to close in the body is the medial physis which gives you 80 percent of the growth and so those are some questions just about the clavicle that are uh, easy to look at um, it, medial clavicle fractures or if you have a sternoclavicular joint dislocation they can be physial fractures of that sc joint um, shaft fractures you know can occur at birth the adolescent shaft fracture still treatment is conservative treatment um, I know the adult literature and, and the grand rounds that Joseph gave, the pendulum is certainly swinging into some uh, operative fixation, but in the, adult, in the pediatric literature and the adolescent clavicle fractures, they still do well um, with the only complication being malunion, but not symptomatic. Um, the other thing to look at is sort of distal clavicle fractures, and I think there was a question on one of these that where the ligaments are still attached, and the ligaments are still usually attached to that periosteum at the coracoid, and it's a, a inferior periosteal sleeve that remains intact, and the superior periosteal sleeve will get disrupted. So that's sort of clavicle fractures in a nutshell. The classification in terms of where you see these medial, lateral, uh, and uh, shaft fractures. Uh, proximal humerus fractures, again, if they're less than 10, and these are anywhere in the same zip code, they will heal. And so the treatment is non-operative treatment, either in, with a uh, near Horowitz grade four, so uh, two thirds of the width, width of the shaft. Um, if they are older, you may consider some type of fixation, close reduction, pinning. It's gonna be you know, truly with a uh, an adolescent who's close to skeletal maturity that you're gonna perform a close reduction. And treatments could be cuff and collar or hanging arm cast. I don't think they'll really get into that too much, but certainly a younger patient with a, a proximal uh, uh, proximal humerus fracture, non-operative treatment, uh, less than 10. All right, uh, elbow fractures, you gotta know sort of uh, the, everyone has a mnemonic for this. I think the crypto is nice and um, uh, uh, politically correct in this, on election day so just understanding what how um the uh physis i'm sorry the uh ossification centers of the elbow sort of come together so the capitellum is first then it's the radial head then the medial epicondyle so you'll see that early but we don't usually see fractures of that till later the trochlea is much later the olecranon and then the lateral epicondyle so sometimes you'll see that you know if you're in the er they'll call you about a fracture if you're ever concerned, get a contralateral view. Um, 
but understanding that when you're looking at an elbow injury and you may have a transficeal fracture, which um, could be from non-accidental trauma in kids. And so just a relationship for the nerves when you're doing cross pinning. Um, so the ulnar nerve is at risk when you're doing a medial pin. If you're doing what's called a uh, Drogan's pin, which is superior lateral, you, you bring into account the uh, radial nerve. And so we tr tend to avoid those and do either uh, three lateral pins or two pins and a cross pin, depending on that. Um, uh, this, it, it, there, there's a little bit overlap here, but um, uh, this is a, a schematic of working through the, the pink pulseless supracondylar humerus fracture or the, you know, the white hand. The, if you're presented with this uh, in your, on your exam of what to do, the thing to do is take them to the OR, perform a close reduction and percutaneous pinning, and then reassess the pulse and so on a, you know, on a fairly urgent basis and then I think it's controversial what you do there unless you have a poorly perfused hand um, then that may be sort of an open reduction and in, in, you know, identify the artery or a white hand but you don't need an angiogram but it's if it's a if you have a pulseless supracondylar humerus fracture close reduction pinning and then reassess uh, the pulse there all right. And so, you know, this is, uh, again, sort of going through some of the um, uh, of what I just sort of talked about, sort of the pink pulseless. If you get a uh, if you have a pulseless, I'm sorry, if you have a well perfused hand, maybe a Doppler signal or at least uh, it's well perfused compared to the contralateral side, you can observe and that pulse will come back. But observing in the hospital is appropriate. If you do truly have a pink pulseless, that's this vascular. Um, and after you reduce it, then maybe re look at your reduction, remove the pins and re-reduce because you want to restore. You've taken one that's pulseless and now you've given it no pulse um, or made it disvascular. And if it's still disvascular, a white hand, which that's how they'll describe it, disvascular, a white hand. I think they'll use these sort of com uh, you know, these words you would do. That would be an indication for open exploration. All right. Uh, complications, nerve palsies. Uh, AIN is the most common, all right, uh, uh, posterior lateral, sort of where the distal fragment is going, so an extension type. You're going to have a posterior lateral, which gives you a big anterior medial spike. That's going to be your AIN palsy. A posterior medial fracture is going to give you a radial nerve, and flexion type are going to give you ulnar nerve, all right, and higher nerve injuries with flexion type as well as a floating elbow. Um, again, we talked about what to do with vascular insufficiency, ulnar nerves. You can to avoid this, you can make a small incision. They talk about increased compartment syndrome and floating elbow. It's probably increased nerve injuries more common than um, than truly the uh, the pulseless. I'm sorry, the uh, compartment syndrome. And then complications. Um, you know, they may present somebody who has what's called a gunstock deformity or cubitus varus. Um, you can correct that to avoid uh, cubitus valg. I'm sorry, to avoid um, a tardy ulnar nerve palsy, um, as well as um, um, posterior lateral uh, rotatory instability. Um, again, it's it's from, and this is it is a mal. What causes cubitus varus is a malunion of a supracondylar. So you got posterior medial rotation. All right. Um, Dr. Scannell, Dr. Pulowski, anything else on supracondylars that we sort of um, probably need to address before we move on? No, I think those are the keys. Yeah, that there will be a there will be a uh, you know a question on it. You know, they have a, a you know a third level question. Maybe they show you an exam. You know, they show you somebody who has a supracondylar humerus fracture, posterior medial, and then they say, what exam, if they have a nerve palsy, what would be the exam finding? So loss of IP flexion uh, for an AIN uh, palsy. And then Dr. Brighton, the only other thing that I would add from um, the questions is just they generally, um, if you have a nerve palsy, they generally, generally want you to observe it so that they have asked that question in the past rather than explore. You do not need to explore. 
Unless you put an ulnar, a pin through the ulnar nerve, then you just remove it. All right. So moving on, um, lateral condyle fractures. Um, if they have less than two millimeters of displacement, uh, or then you, I'm sorry, two millimeters to four millimeters, you can do a close reduction and pinning, even an arthrogram. Uh, if it's more displaced or rotated, you would do an open reduction. You try to avoid uh, the posterior blood supply. Again, if they heal with a malunion, they can get cubitus valgus and an ulnar nerve palsy. And overgrowth is a common, um, a common um, complication with these. They have these lateral spurring. And while it's not really considered, uh, people call it a complication, it's a known thing. It, what it means is that you've stripped off that lateral periosteum. Um, medial epicondyle fractures, an absolute indication to fix it would be an incarcerated fragment in the joint associated with an elbow uh, dislocation. I think the other indications to fix it in terms of displacement, other things are um, are a little bit softer and, and a little bit more controversial. Um, the stiffness is common regardless of the uh, treatment, right? And it's usually an avulsion of that flexor pronator mass. Um, again, here's sort of the lateral condyle fractures um, even with a non-union, such as this picture in the bottom right, you can do a ORIF and just actually still fix it sort of in situ there. Sometimes you you may need to do some type of uh, takedown or get it there, but um, they'll talk about non-union still doing an ORIF. The top right picture, there's a more displaced one. Again, because that fracture is sort of posterior lateral, that internal oblique will allow you to see that on the x-ray. Um, again, medial condyle fractures, we talked about the indication is um, entrapment in the joint. You know, one of the questions may be, how do you reduce these? If it is associated with a, uh, you know, how do you reduce a, a elbow dislocation with a medial epicondyle fracture? You can do extension and supination as you do your reduction maneuver to try to pull that fragment out of the joint. Um, so here we we are in terms of the uh, um, x-ray findings. Um, uh, this slide was sort of in here. I haven't ever done a distal humerus axial view to see a, a medial epicondyle fracture. This says medial condyle, but I would think they meant medial epicondyle fracture. So um, this is what we were talking about, about distal physeal separations or not accidental trauma. We've, I've seen one of these with a birth trauma. I've seen a couple of these with non-accidental trauma, and I've seen several with even just trauma. Um, but in the young kids, you have to be aware of a birth trauma or non-accidental trauma. Cubitus varus is common with these. They tend to slide, and so fixing them is hard to tell without an arthrogram. And again, this sort of, if you don't get fooled that this is an elbow dislocation, and so the one way you can tell is where's the capitellum as it goes with the with the joint there, right? And so this is sort of all different um, um, x-rays here of, of injuries. Um, but you can always see that the capitellum should, I'm sorry, the radial shaft should point at the capitellum. So in this case, in A, the uh, capitellum and, and radius are well aligned, and so something has happened to that distal humerus that has, has shifted through that physis there. All right. And the treatment, again, is closed reduction, pinning. You may think about an arthrogram for that as well. All right. Let me, I'm just going to try to... Actually, this will, this will go here. Okay. Uh, next, we're still in the elbow, radial neck fractures. Again, if it's got more than 30 degrees of angulation, you would think about doing some type of treatment, whether it's a closed reduction, a K-wire joystick, or this metazo technique, which is putting a K-wire up the radius, grabbing that piece, and then reducing it. And so um, I, I think generally they won't, you know, test you on this unless um, you know, they're going to just sort of show you an obvious fracture, maybe associated um, you know, a Montezio fracture variant with a, a radial neck fracture. Forearm fractures, and so we see lots of those in, you know, in, 
and kids having some indications for what a operative treatment would be in terms of rotation and angulation. So I think if they have greater than 10 degrees of angulation, it's a more proximal fracture, and that would be an indication of a child greater than 10. Um, bayonet apposition, you can certainly accept in children less than 10 years of age, um, and uh, operative fixation either with flexible nails or, or ORIF. Uh, they probably wouldn't give you both choices unless the patient was clearly skeletally mature. That there's a refracture risk. I think the other things is there's a paper that reports compartment syndrome with multiple three a reduction attempts and rod passage. And so, if you, if the scenario would be if you are trying to uh, fix or operate on a both bone forearm fracture and you pass the rod more than three times, what should your next step be? It should be go to an open reduction or an open assisted reduction to then pass those nails to avoid compartment syndrome. All right. Um, and plastic deformation in these fractures does not remodel. And so you do have to, you know, in a case like this where it's green stick and a little bit, but a large plastic deformation of the ulna, you have to re you have to reduce that there. All right. Montasia fractures, I don't think they're going to test you on beta classification, but type one being the most common is anterior, uh, type three being lateral. All right. Um, um, and then the type four being associated shaft fracture, radial shaft fracture with the um, with a uh, ulna fracture as well, leading to a radial head dislocation. Um, a lot of times they um, uh, it's a it's a very subtle finding, so not missing that on the X-ray. Um, but I think the treatment is you have to fix the ulna. Uh, if it's comminuted, you have to plate it. Uh, you can for you can do a closed reduction. You can do intramedullary nailing if it is a short transverse fracture. But if they're longer oblique or length unstable, you have to think about some other treatment. All right. So moving on, uh, cast index has been um, applied before. Uh, cast index has been uh, treated before. Sort of how to calculate it. They may say. They could give you these measurements or this little, they're not going to give you that the cast index equals A over B, but sort of it's your lateral divided by your AP. And so you're, you want a smaller cast index. You don't want a, a large cast index. And so if you just look at your forearm, it is, if you're looking at your forearm, if you look across your radius to your ulna, you're wider there than you are from your your um, the volar to the dorsal surface there and so however you would remember that it's that sagittal width over the coronal width there for cast index all right any other upper extremity comments um, they didn't really we didn't really get into distal radius fractures small um, if they're late presenting with a Salter Harris two distal radius fracture if it's more than seven days, you may not try to manipulate it or you may just let it heal rather than manipulating it to avoid growth arrest. That may be another sort of question there. Um, you can have associated compartment syndromes with distal radius fractures in kids. Um, Brian or Mike, anything else if you're still on? I just put a comment in the chat box. Um, the distal humerus axial view for medial epicondyle um, is probably testable. It's been out about five years now. Uh, I put the link to the paper that was done. It was a cadaveric study, but that um, that view actually marks the most uh, displacement of the medial epicondyle. So I, I think it probably is reasonable for them to test on it. Okay. Um, and Dr. Brandon, yeah, there there is a question about that that has come up before. And then the only other thing I would say is there's um, regarding elbow injuries, is there's been a question before about sort of if a kid at a supercondyl or comes out of the cast at three weeks, comes back six weeks later, still has some stiffness of the elbow, and they they basically want you not to do anything to it, knowing that the range of motion is going to continue to improve over time. Yeah, there, I mean, the papers say that there's no indication for physical therapy um, and that they should get 90% of their motion back and they will and they will get keep getting, I'm sorry, they will keep getting motion back up to a year. But in that paper about they have, most of them have 90% of their motion 
after six weeks after their pins come out. Although sometimes we do get therapy. Yeah, some do, but they don't want they not in this one. They want you to just sort of take it easy. So, uh, all right. So we're going to move on to pelvis and lower extremity. It looks like we. Um, Again, I think some of this is going to be a lot of stuff. A lot of the pelvic injuries in kids are non-operative. However, you know, as Dr. Clark mentioned in his talk last week, apophyseal injuries are testable. So knowing where the insertion uh, of these muscles origin or insertion of these muscles are that may lead to avulsion fractures. And so while you can see lesser trochanter fractures in adults, and that may represent some malignant or pathologic fracture, in kids, the iliopsoas can pull that off. The uh, hamstrings, uh, adductor magnus, um, and your hamstrings can pull off the uh, ischial tuberosity, um, hip rotators, the AIIS, they feel a pop in their hip and they can have the rectus femoris. And the ASIS can be either tensor fasciolata or, um, or uh, sartorius there, all right? All right, so um, <clears throat> moving on, um, the close, you know, um, the Del Bay classification for proximal femur fractures. Um, so these Del Bay ones and twos, the high, the closer you are to the physis or to that, um, and further up the femoral neck, the higher the rate of AVN. All right, it is also a matter of displacement as well. Um, the basi cervicals uh, and the inner trochs, not uh, lower rates of AVN, but certainly can happen. This basi cervical, you know, depending on how it's fixed, may need to um, uh, be, it may fall into varus. Sometimes doing some type of fixation with a spica cast would be appropriate there. And so here's your AVN, AVN rates there with the type 2. Uh, being, you know, one of the more common ones and a 50% risk of AVN, um, whereas the type 4, um, uh, the uh, intertrochanteric femur fracture sort of being um, just a lower risk of AVN of at 14% there. So these are some general numbers there. I think for the ones, um, you have the uh, nearly 100%, whereas the 50, and then... 30 and 15 there. So if you can remember those numbers, all right. Um, femoral shaft fractures, I, you know, again, Dr. Clark talked about this, but I think this is really, this summarizes it. You have to consider, you know, there's AOS practice guidelines on this. You have to consider non-accidental trauma if they are less than three years of age. Although it's more likely that if they're before walking age that it's non-accidental trauma, all right. Um, Pavlik harness treatment for those under six months of age, a spica cast even up to the age of five, um, you know, flexible nails in that five to 11 year range or bridge plating if it's length unstable, and then lateral entry nails um, as long as they're not in the piriformis, either troke entry or lateral entry nails if they're older. You may think about an X fix uh, for a polytrauma. The risk with X rix is the risk with external fixation is refracture once they come off. You can ex, you can get a leg length discrepancy um, with some overgrowth, and again, we know not to use piriformis nails. And even with the troke entry nails, you just want you want to leave some bone medially there. Okay. Um, Dr. Brighton, sorry to interrupt you. Real quick, will you speak to how you determine the um, size of flex nails for femurs because that's been testable before too. Yes, it's 80% of the diameter of the, of the femur divided by two that will give you then the nails. So you want 80% canal fill. So say you have a eight millimeter femoral shaft canal. Um, so you can divide 80% of that is, you know, 64, right? Uh, or 6.4 millimeters. And so then you would have to divide that by two would get you about a three, 3.2. So you're going to get like a three to a 3.5 millimeter nail in that um, femur, right? And so that's where sure you would have to, you, you can start with that as sort of your, 
uh, starting point, but you don't want to stagger your nails. You don't want a 3.0 and a 3.5 because that'll get you closest. You want to have two, two nails that you can safely get across, have some bend, uh, and not try to overstuff it. So, but it's the it's the eighty percent canal fill is what you would want to do. Um, distal femur fractures, again, Salter Harris two distal femur fractures. Um, the uh, Thurston Holland fragment that's that large metaphyseal fragment. Um, if it's a if there's Salter Harris two fractures, you can fix them either with crossed wires and, or if the piece is large enough, you can fix them with screws. Right. Um, growth disturbance can happen, and it's not a, generally a complete growth disturbance. You have to think about uh, more angular deformities with these. Okay, um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, um, so the ligaments are attached to the physis, so this is not a ligamentous avulsion. Um, they've usually had uh, an injury. These can be, you can have a posterior fragment um, that, you know, may be better with cross pinned, but these medial or lateral fragments there. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, tibial tubercle fractures. Thinking about. Uh, Hang on. Can you do one thing on the distal uh, femur supercondylars? Um, I saw something about uh, valgus overgrowth in those. Yeah. So yeah. So what they um, that would be if you plate a distal femur fracture, exactly. it makes it a valgus overgrowth. Is that what they're talking about? Yeah, that's. I saw a picture or a um, a question on that. So yeah, yeah plating just like plating a supracondylar femur fracture yeah. uh, can result in valgus overgrowth. Yeah. But the other thing, the other thing would be to think of so you know in this example that we have here um if the with this fracture here if you know depending on the fracture that you have you can still see that the physis so we'll call this i, I don't see the fibula here although this is so this looks like the medial fragment is intact so these screws went some medial to lateral for this diagram it looks like the fibula is down there um, you could say that this one could potentially grow into some valgus because you still have the physis medially, and then you're starting to grow into some valgus based on that. Um, and so following, you know, they could show you the screws that are no longer parallel and, and why is that, but the angular deformities are there. But as Dr. Casey mentioned, submuscular plating or, or plating of metaphyseal distal femur fractures, if you leave the plate in, they can, they sort of tension that side and can grow into some valgus. All right. Um, tibial tubercle fractures. I know Dr. Clark mentioned this last week about the risk of compartment syndrome. Um, you know, these can extend into the joint as well. These require operative fixation to restore the extensor mechanism. It is usually an eccentric uh, in uh, loading injury, um, either from jumping or basketball sprinting, and they'll feel this pop in their knee. And so those ones that extend up into the joint, the type threes, you got to look for some meniscal entrapment, and you may have to visualize the articular surface, either indirectly on x-ray or directly direct visualization there. And so here's this anterior recurrent tibial artery. These would just be um, expanding hematoma within the closed compartment there. Okay, um, tibials uh, moving down. I know you talked a little bit about tibial shaft fractures last week, but the transitional ankle fractures is important to know. You have sort of that anterior, uh, I'm sorry, that central, then the medial, and then it swings around to the lateral side in terms of the physial closure, which leads to the uh, triplane type fracture or the talo type fracture that you can see here. So these require, if it's got more than two millimeters of displacement, they require uh, operative fixation. All right. Again, sort of uh, in the physis, where does, um, uh, where do physial fractures happen through? They really happen through that hypertrophic zone. Okay. Uh, the skiffies as well happen through the hypertrophic zone. Um, most active physis are the proximal humerus and distal radius and the 
uh, upper extremities and then the distal femur and proximal tibia and the lower extremities there. All right. Bars can, uh, physeal bar, if it's less than 50% um, of the, um, and you can do some mapping with this with CT and MRI, but if it's less than 50% of the physeal surface or peripherally, you can do an excision. Um, if it's, uh, if you're starting to get some deformity, you may need angular correction or a complete epiphysiodesis there or an osteotomy. So just some things to think about a physeal bar, but that being 50%, you can do a resection with interposition with fat um, or some other type of material. All right. Non-accidental trauma. Um, again, they can ask questions on this. If you see a kid with a, a young kid with a um, distal humerus fracture, non-walking age, having a femur fracture, uh, these classic metaphyseal lesions or these corner fractures, which are basically happening at the corner, at the edge of the physis where the periosteum is attached to that. Um, posterior rib fractures, those are all sort of pathognomonic for non-accidental trauma or fractures at different stages of healing. So skeletal survey may pick that up as well. So, um, but the one thing to sort of do is get um, child Protective Services, Social Work, somebody involved uh, to deal with this. And so that, that may be the question that sort of pops up there. Um, this, this talks about uh, polytrauma, just understanding that children in differences that central nervous system and traumatic brain injury are the most common things that lead to um, both injury as well as morbidity and mortality in these kids. Um, they have a larger head, and so when you're thinking about supporting their C-spine, having a cutout or having something behind their shoulders, um, they have smaller airway. The other thing is they, ha they tend to have upper cervical spine injuries less than eight years of age uh, and, not, and less subaxial um, uh, C-spine injuries. All right. We'll have Dr. Casey take over now. No. We'll do the pediatric hip. All right. Any questions from the lower extremity? Anything that Dr. Clark brought up on last week's talk that I didn't cover? I think it was good that he had done that one recently. So we didn't really talk about tibial shaft fractures. Um, you can do flexible nailing, uh, which we didn't mention in the the adult uh, in the pediatric one, but the weight is about is you know, about 50 kilograms or 100 pounds in terms of failures of flex nailing, using flexible nailing if they weigh over 100 pounds. In tibia, in tibia fractures, that's not the case for flexible nailing. So you can use flexible nails in, in heavier kids. All right. So we'll move on to uh, skiffies. All right. Slip capital femoral epiphysis, or if you're from Australia, Sufi slipped upper capital femoral epiphysis. But this is a failure of the physis through the hypertrophic zone, right? Risk factors, obese, endocrine abnormalities, uh, retroversion of the femur. Um, and it's more predominant in males than, than females. And so these x-rays show um, a what we call a Klein's line, which is seen on your AP view. And that is a line drawn up to the superior lateral neck and it should touch the femoral head whereas on a slip side it would not touch the femoral head and there you have a slip. Um, knee pain is in any child that presents with knee pain you have to uh, be concerned for hip pain. Uh, they're going to have they're going to go into obligate external rotation as they as you start to flex the hip which means that they're going into external rotation as you bring that up they're going to lose abduction, they're going to lose internal rotation um, as well. Um, again, there's a stable and unstable classification. Stable meaning that you can weight bear on it. Um, and then uh, treatment is basically going to be uh, percutaneous in situ fixation. I don't think they're going to start to ask about surgical dislocation for this um, uh, procedure. Maybe in the, uh, the unstable slip, you may think about doing two screws rather than one. All right. So again, um, for the contralateral hip, um, if they have an open triradiate cartilage, they have an endocrine abnormality, uh, 
Um, they're probably not going to test you on how to calculate the modified Oxford score, but if it's less than or equal to 18, you may think about that. And that is a, those are markers around the pelvis x-ray that you could generally see of the triradiate cartilage, the greater trochanter, the iliac apophysis, the lesser trochanter, and you can score this as well. Um, but, um, pinning the, the, um, the other side would be appropriate. So you may have a patient who's hypothyroidism or hypogonadism, and it would be appropriate to do a contralateral pinning on that patient. All right. Any um, higher complication rate of AVN in the unstable slips? All right. Anywhere from 6 to 46. You can see percentages all over the place with that. Stable slips generally have zero you know, or very low AVN rates. They should be zero. Um, and Dr. Brighton, just to add on that note, there's been one tricky question in the past, which basically said that a patient was able to bear weight with crutches, and they do consider that stable. Um, yeah. So that was just a key kind of, you know, maybe counterintuitive pearl. Yeah. I mean, we think of it more as mechanically unstable versus that, but and it's a tough definition, but um, I think just understanding that the unstable ones um, are more at risk for uh, AVN. All right, here's a list of facts about uh, Perthes disease. All right, so it's typically the hyperactive boy, uh, age four to eight. Um, they they sort of look the opposite of what a, a skiffy patient would look like. Um, they may have delayed bone age. There's uh, the mechanism may be um, a coagulopathy or repetitive microtrauma, and there's this watershed area of the uh, vascularization of the proximal uh, femur. Um, you can go through uh, I uh, the Walderstrom uh, stages. Really, just sort of knowing about there's a, there's initial stage. Um, and it may take up to a year to a year and a half to go through uh, the reossification, but it may take uh, you know quite some time to go through the stages here. But this initial stage, you can get sclerotic, and then you start to get maybe a little bit of a collapse, or and start to see this crescent sign, which is a subchondral lucency or a fracture. That's when they may start to have um, they may start to have a limp. They may start to have some pain, thigh pain or knee pain, which is the referred hip pain. And then they'll start to go through the reossification and then the remodeling, and you're looking for congruency of the hip. The treatment for many of these kids um, that they show you for Perthes are going to be physical therapy, range of motion, maybe a period of non-weight bearing. Um, but a lot of times it's physical therapy. Generally, if you're le a boy less than eight or a girl less than six, you will do much better. Um, or if you are a pillar, a lateral pillar A or B, which is seen on the AP radiograph, but it is seen much later. That's it's in that fragmentation stage that you would start to see that. Um, and so here is sort of a the um, the progression of this going from sclerotic to an early collapse to a, a some fragmentation and then some resolution, where you can see either coxa magna large head, coxa breva, short necks, or coxa plana, a flat head. And so those would be sort of the three sequelae of the femoral head that you may see in, in AVN. I mean, I'm sorry, in, uh, in Perthes disease. Dr. Casey, anything you'd add to this? She may be muted. The other thing that people are do, starting to do are perfusion MRIs to look uh, a little bit earlier to stage these. I don't know that we're there yet with this, but the 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 um, large Perthy study group study that came out years ago really had sort of these predictors of the age uh, and the lateral pillar classification. And so they didn't, not doing well with, with or without surgery if you were in that stage, uh, stage uh, I'm sorry, the group, the lateral pillar group C um, if you have some of these other signs, too, with the uh, lateral calcification or subluxation, those are uh, bad actors. All right. Um, 
again, the treatment is early motion, but if you are if you are going to do surgery, a femoral osteotomy to tuck the head in for these lateral B's and C's in the older kids, um, or in a late phase, you may be thinking about more of a shelf or salvage type procedure. All right. So that's uh, Perthes. All right. Hip dysplasia. All right. So risk factors for hip dysplasia. Family history, breach, firstborn, female. All right. But, and so screening ultrasounds are recommended for breech babies, um, usually done at six to eight weeks. And the reason being, if you do it earlier, they're overcalled. Um, you can do an ultrasound up till, you know, at least four months, even sometimes up to six months, and then x rays sometime beyond, usually beyond four to six months. Okay. Um, if the hip is dislocated, it, you know, usually you would go to the OR then and perform an arthrogram and enclose versus open reduction. Uh, the medial dipole, uh, if it's a large medial dipole, they have seven millimeters here, or um, you would do an open reduction. So these are some of the blocks to the, the reduction, the inverted labrum, uh, the um, transverse acetabular ligament, iliopsoas tendon, pulvinar, and ligamentous teres, right? And then generally we're getting some type of post-reduction um, three, you know, Im axial imaging, whether it's a CT versus an MRI after a closed reduction. Um, again, knowing that the Barlow and Ordolani maneuvers, right? So Barlow instability, you're sort of pushing it towards the bed. So you're trying to drive that head out. Head out. So it starts in and then when you adduct and, and give it some axial compression, that hip will go posterior dislocated or, or subluxate posteriorly. Um, the dislocated, the one that's out, or the ortolani, right? The disloc the hip is out, and that is that hip clunk. So that's an ortolani positive hip. And so those are ones that need a treatment. Treatment in the younger child is usually a pavlic harness. Um, you may see in the later child, um, you know, up to you know even at six months and beyond. Limited hip abduction. Uh, if they're walking, you'll see pelvic obliquity, lumbar lordosis, a Trinellenberg gait, even some toe walking to compensate for a leg length discrepancy. Asymmetric thigh folds is another one. It's a it's a weak sign, but you may see it there. So again, here's our treatment algorithm: pavlic harness. If the pavlic harness doesn't work after three weeks, you would do a hip abduction brace, um, and then if you fail close treatment with a brace, then you go close treatment with a close reduction and spike a cast adductor tenotomy to include increase our safe zone. All right. And so that's the ability to abduct the hip um, uh, without tension because um, uh, as that hip it remains out, that adductor gets tight. Um, if you fail a close reduction, you can do an open reduction that can either be done medially. Um, the disadvantage of that is you don't get to do a capsulography. Um, anteriorly, you can do a capsulography and this, and the um, medial femoral circumflex artery is at risk if you do a medial approach there. Um, 18 months to three years, you would generally do an anterior open reduction. Um, you may need to do a femoral shortening osteotomy or a little bit of varus or a pelvic osteotomy. And then in the older patients with uh, dysplasia, you have to do a periostabular osteotomy, all right? Complications from a pavlic, if you have a femoral nerve palsy, they're flexed too much, and so if you're pinching that nerve. Femoral head AVN, if you have too much abduction, and so you're causing uh, pressure on the posterior vessels. Uh, inferior dislocation or an obturator dislocation, you drive it inferiorly out, and failure is uh, non-compliance or uh, sometimes hips uh, can't be reduced. All right. Any other questions for DDH or comments, Dr. Casey, Skinnell, others? All right. That's good. All right. We'll keep going. Rory, can I get a drink? Yeah. Like um, water? Thank you. All right. Um, so moving on, we'll do uh, cerebral palsy, all right? 
So non-progressive uh, injury to the brain, okay? So it can either happen, you know, uh, in utero or sort of very close to you know, perinatal um, time. It, you know, in, intraventricular hemorrhages may cause cerebral palsy or hemiplegia, all right? So risk factors being premature or anoxic brain injury. Um, really sort of uh, most important predictors for Walking is independent sitting by age two. Um, the classifications is, is generally this gross motor classification scheme. And so five being completely wheelchair dependent, um, four being able to get upright with assisted devices and a walker and, and using a, a power chair where, um, versus three versus two. Two is sort of walking, but may have to use some um, on a, in a uneven surfaces. I generally think of the, the threes as needing some type of assisted device with braces or um, a walker to get around. And then we have the anatomic. We think about, you know, quadriplegic, uh, diplegic, legs more than arms, or hemiplegic versus spasticity or ataxic and everything else. So they may ask you GMFCS, the incidence of hip dysplasia or um, and uh, hip dislocation as well as scoliosis increases as you start to go up in GMFCS classification. So the more severely involved, the more likely you are to have some type of uh, hip dis dislocation like you have here versus, um, uh, versus the uh, ambulator, okay? <clears throat> All right, um, moving on. So CP treatment, um, pre-op uh, evaluation, sort of doing nutrition, seating, pulmonary function. Um, if they're on certain seizure medicine, you have to think about coagulation. Treatment can be baclofen and Botox, tenotomies for uh, tight uh, tendons or contractures. And so the big thing that they're talking about is what they call semels or single event multi-level surgery and so rather than just doing the hamstrings one year and then coming back the next year and doing the adductors and then doing the TALs another year and casting sort of these birthday surgeries trying to do multiple surgeries at single uh yeah at one time point uh and the patients tolerate it well and do better from that all right tendon transfers may help in spasticity especially in the foot um, you know, treatment for dislocated hips, you can do femoral osteotomies and pelvic osteotomies. The deficiency in the hip in these patients is uh, uh, posterior, all right, superior and posterior. Um, and so an osteotomy that helps with that. Um, and then um, you know, one of the salvage procedures can be femoral head resection. Scoliosis surgery, you're going to think about, you know, fusing them to the pelvis. Um, to prevent this. So hip conditions and CP, again, rare in those type, the GMFCS type one, but in the type fives, it's greater than 90%. It's the abnormal tone. They can have a windswept deformity. It leads to femoral head, gradual subluxation, dislocation, and then uh, hip degeneration there. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, this just talks about hip imaging here. I think in the immature pelvis, understanding um, sort of what Hilgenreiner's line is, what Perkins line is. We talk about acetabular index as a measure off that horizontal line to the edge of the sore seal. All right. Should be less than 24 by 24 months. When we're talking about migration percentage. Okay. You can see that here. Which portion of how much of that femoral head width is outside the lateral edge of the acetabulum there, all right? And so once you're getting, you know, beyond that 50% femoral head coverage or that migration percentage, that's when you may need to think about doing some type of, of uh, hip-containing procedure uh, in these CP patients, all right? Um, again, this is the, we talked about sort of sore seal, the teal drop, understanding where the ilioischial and iliopectineal lines are. This is probably going to come up more in acetabular uh, trauma um, 
uh, type things rather than it is in the uh, pediatric patient. But you may think about, you know, they may show you a hip and, and show you protrusio. Protrusio is when the femoral head passes beyond the ilioischial line here. And so you may see that in conditions such as uh, Marfan's or osteogenesis imperfecta. And so these uh, x-rays here show a Hilgenreiner's line, which is that line through the uh, triradiate cartilage labeled H, Perkins line, which is a perpendicular to that off the lateral edge. You can see that the what's labeled as A here, um, those are, are the acetabular indices measuring 32 and 28. So they're abnormal, uh, depending on what the age is. But if you look here, that Shenton's line, which should be following the inferior portion of the femoral neck, is disrupted. And you're in the superior lateral quadrant there of that, you know, that quadrant made by Perkins and Hilgerdreiner's line. And that represents superior dislocation. So these are bilateral superior hip dislocations in this patient here. All right. So depending on their age and their pathology, um, you may decide of an open uh, closed versus open treatment. Uh, if they're older, you may think about an open reduction um, and, a, and a combined pelvic and femoral osteotomy. This is a, what they call an AIR view or abduction internal rotation view to see it sort of mimics what um, taking out some of their internal rotation or their femoral version as well as that valgus to see how does that hip reduce. So it may guide you in terms of performing a varus osteotomy, but you also want to see congruency of the joint as if you're doing periacetabular osteotomies, how is that head going to sit once it's uh, reduced there? And so that's uh, an x-ray that you can use to tell this there. Um, the CP hip is normal at birth. Um, but then just because of the abnormal tone, you start to get uh, some changes as it's going on. So this is, again, uh, measuring this Reimer's migration percentage here of what percentage of the ossified head is outside the acetabulum there, all right? And as I mentioned before, posterior superior acetabular deficiency, we're in DDH um, or in cases that we're thinking about um, doing periastabular osteotomies, it's an anterior lateral uh, deficiency there, or they're more deficient anteriorly there, all right? And so hips at risk are sort of, uh, um, you know, they talk about sort of hip at risk. You can do um, Botox, stretching, adductor uh, tenotomies. Once Shenton's line is disrupted and you have, you know, increased subluxation sort of at least the 50%, you may think about VDRO, and if they're completely dislocated, you're going to need to do uh, open reductions, okay? I don't think they'll get, yeah, they may get, sort of give you a scenario, and you have to sort of work through that a little bit there. Um, so again, we've talked about what, you know, what those uh, procedures are. Reconstruction um, with an open reduction is usually when that migration percentage is greater than 50%. Somebody want to add something to that? All right. So this is uh, just Botox in these patients. It can last two to three months. This is the mechanism of action that's it's blocking that presynaptic release of acetylcholine. Uh, All right. And so no, no acetylcholine gets released. Um, Gabapentin is a, I'm sorry, a baclofen is a GABA agonist. An intrathecal, the pumps work better than the oral because it crosses the blood-brain barrier. All right. Uh, cerebral palsy, talk about some gait patterns. They can have toe walking from a contracted equinus. They can have jump gait um, or a crouch gait. You know, jump gait, they're up on their toes and their hips and knees are flexed. Where crouch gait, they're sort of collapsed down. Or they may have a stiff knee gait. The treatment for a stiff knee gait is to transfer the rectus femoris to the medial hamstring. All right, and so I think these are some different things. Um, you know, what uh, prescription for surgery for these type of of patients, but also um, bracing strategies as well. All right. So I'll let you sort of go through that, but you know, for that crouch gait. Um, Sometimes the ground reaction AFO, 
which I'll show you in this picture here, is sort of this ground reaction or floor reaction. You can imagine that that's driving the tibia posteriorly as they are in their um, stance phase. And so it's trying to take them out of their uh, crouch position there. So that's one, um, one AFO that they may uh, use uh, or be able to test about. All right, so we're going to move into limping child and some infection. Anything else on CP? Um, Brian, did you comment on uh, Achilles lengthenings in CP? I may have missed it. Uh, no, we we didn't. Uh, I think for um, you know some of these kids, especially um, in the you especially in the uh, in the ambulators um, or. We can go back to sort of these gait patterns as well. Let me uh, shoot. We had the gait patterns earlier. I don't know if I sort of skipped through this before a little bit. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Um, so in these gait patterns where you have these jump, jump knee pattern or they're up on their toes there, you don't necessarily want to lengthen their Achilles because you're just going to drive them into this crouch gate now because they don't have that um they, they sort of collapse down and they uh they need that energy that's stored in there so rather than doing an achilles lengthening you may do a gastroc lengthening in these in these uh kids even though they have ankle aquinas there <coughs> you don't want to over lengthen the achilles anything else you'd add on that dr scannell no that was the main point thanks All right. All right. So we'll move on to limping child. The the uh, for a limping child, it's in it is trauma, trauma, trauma. Those are the first. That's the number cause number one, two, and three, and then it's things like infection or hip problems or something else or JIA or transient synovitis. So think trauma first, and then. Uh, the um, hip, and so I'm sorry. Then, then infection. Even though that's not how it usually works in the emergency department. Um, but as we think about, in, as they think about, infection is going to get tested, and and the way they'll present this are children with elevated inflammatory markers, fever. You know, sort of how do you work this up? How do you distinguish this between septic arthritis and transient synovitis? And so those Croker criteria are established there. And there's sort of a fifth marker uh, with the CRP of greater than two um, being added on there as well. But if you have an elevated temperature of greater than 101.3, inability to bear weight, a white blood cell count greater than 12,000, and a SED rate greater than 40 or CRP greater than two, this is distinguishing septic arthritis from transient synovitis. And in some studies, it's almost 98%. In another series, it's 60%. So there's a range there depending on what series you're looking at. Um, but the common things being staph aureus, uh, as well as strep um, in the younger kids, especially if they haven't been vaccinated, maybe H flu. <laughs> Another bacteria is Kingella, but it's hard to grow a gram negative um, uh, bacteria. And then you have to think about gonorrhea in uh, adolescence. All right, uh, with septic arthritis, or if they have septic emboli um, or a DVT, you have to think MRSA. Or if they have a high elevated CRP, uh, think MRSA. All right. Um, again, they're going to be gram positive cocci um, is going to be staph aureus there. Right. So this is a way we don't typically do this in our um, uh, in our institution, but ultrasound. All right. So to look for a hip effusion. All right, and so you have an increased space between the femoral head and neck, and that's that schematic there, and between the caps and the joint capsule there. So you can see an effusion, which may need to be aspirated there. All right, um, osteomyelitis, usually in the metaphysis, you have these closed loops of the metaphyseal blood supply, and the uh, fractures will, um, um, the, I'm sorry, you'll get some sort of sludging and slower um, uh, blood flow through there, which, could, which can lead to some extravasation of uh, infection material, and it sort of sets up shop there. So that sequestrum, uh, 
then can be a uh, nidus for infection. That's that necrotic bone. And then the involucrum is that new bone that is formed around there. So the sequestrum and involucrum, so understanding them. The other thing is, um, and if Dr. Casey's still on, she has a way to remember which joints are infected. Uh, Except which, I, I screwed it up last time, so I don't want to tell you. I didn't plan for this. All right. It's, it's sitting in the bathtub, but I, I can't. Sitting in the bathtub, but I think you have your your arms and your elbows at your side when you're sitting in the bathtub. So your sh and your shoulders are in there too, but your wrists are out and your knees are out. So anything that would be in the water, the ankles, the hips, um, uh, and uh, yeah, ankles and hips that would be in the water are. Um, are within the joint capsule there. So um, here, proximal femur, proximal humerus, proximal radius, distal tibia. These are all within the. So if you could picture yourself sitting in a bathtub with these joints in the in there, then you are uh, your hands are out of the water. So there you go. Um, but these are the ones that you can have associated septic joint from a metaphyseal osteomyelitis, all right? Uh, it doesn't mean that the others can't happen or you can't have an associated joint effusion or something like that with this, but these are the, the common ones where you will get spread from the metaphysis into the, the joint there, all right? All right, and then let's see. Um, you know, they'll give you a scenario like this, um, just knowing, uh, you know, pseudomonas is from a foot or a puncture wound through your shoe. Knee pain or rash after you've been to Lyme, Connecticut is Lyme disease. Um, you know, blood cultures, um, I'm sorry, hard to culture is or gram negative Kingella. So you put it in these blood culture vials. <clears throat> um, uh, neonatal septus, sepsis, staph aureus, and uh, as well, uh, I'm sorry, uh, GBS, and then um, staph aureus is uh, the common cause for acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. Even in the sickle cell, where they'll talk about uh, salmonella being an um, uh, organism that can happen, that you can get it in bone, still their most common presentation is staph aureus infections. All right. And I think also. Yellow, they frequently like to say, like, five-year-old in daycare. Yeah. All right. This is, um, uh, this looks like pharmaceuticals here. So um, I, I couldn't tell you anything about this other than look at this the day before the test or just don't look at it at all and just give this question away. So I don't have anything to add other than cephalosporins right it acts on the cell wall that's i know and Ceph, that's it <laughs> all right there's more information on that in um one of the basic science lectures that's available on the dropbox for everybody all right so we'll look at growth and development sort of what's normal and what's not um and we go till seven here yep or as late as we want here are there any other high yield topics kelsey that i got to get to um, yeah, I think understanding we've, we, you know, we've get, I've given this talk before and Dr. Scannell as well about rotational and Boeing deformities and what's normal and what's not. So understanding, um, uh, you know, what, what is normal and generally observation would be the, uh, you know, initial treatment. Um, you know, you can have genuvarum, which is normal, then you can have physiologic genuvalgum. Um, but if it's progressive, you investigate, all right, and then surgery may be indicated. Um, Blount's disease, sort of measuring this metaphyseal diaphyseal adrenin, which is a uh, perpendicular to the lateral shaft, and then you measure the, the angle of the metaphysis, I'm sorry, that physis there, or the uh, metaphysis. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and if it's greater than 20, then that's, I'm sorry, if it's greater than 16, it's abnormal, and that may be Blount's disease in these younger kids. All right. And so you can brace 
the younger kids, or you do a valgus osteotomy. In the older kids, you may have to do either a pipsiodesis or a, uh, a correctional osteotomy there. All right. Tibial bowing. Okay, this is knowing what's good and what's not. So posterior medial bowing is okay. You will have a good night. You can sleep on it. PM. All right. And that is associated with calcaneal valgus, but you're going to have to know that that may be associated with a limb length discrepancy if they truly have that. Anterior lateral bowing, uh, you can see that with congenital pseudarthrosis of the tibia, commonly seen in neurofibromatosis, or anterior medial bowing, so you get a deficient fibula, that may lead to anterior medial bowing. And so maybe have a ball and socket ankle joint or a, a leg length discrepancy. So as we talk about some of these um, uh, lower extremity deficiencies, tibial hemimelia, um, really the key to treatment is do they have an intact quadriceps mechanism? And so you may be left with a choice of trying to do some reconstruction versus uh, you know, a through knee amputation or some prosthesis with a sign amputation. Uh, fibular deficiency, the sonic hedgehog gene, I think understanding all of the um, different findings that you may see on these with Tarsal coalition, ankle instability with a ball and socket ankle joint. Uh, they may have a, a valgus, either a quinovalgus. They could also have club foot deformity as well. Um, they have a, they may have absent lateral raise of the foot, um, and they may have a, a hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle and cruciate deficiencies as well. All right, uh, leg length discrepancy. You know, Hang on, we're fast. We'll say again. Uh, just on those fibular deficiencies, I've seen them ask the question about how many rays would you consider salvageable? So if the foot has less than three rays, then amputation is going to be your treatment. Just in three. I'm sorry. Three is the magic number. If it has three or more, you're good. Three or more, you can consider it. Yeah. If less than three, then don't. I might even be three and under, but yeah, it's All a bird. Right. I can't remember which one. So um, leg length discrepancy. OK, so understanding, you know, where the growth happens. OK, <clears throat> that most of that growth is coming either nine or ten millimeters from the distal femur and six millimeters from the proximal tibia as well as the distal tibia um, external uh, in terms of lengthening. Uh, maybe there's a slide. I know Dr. Pulowski gives a talk on that, but if you have less than two centimeters, you may think about just a shoe lift. Um, uh, two to five, you can think about an epipsiadesis. Um, more than five centimeters, you think about lengthening, all right? Um, and then more than 20, you may think about an amputation. Now, we are certainly in the day and age of uh, that this has an ISKD, which we're not using anymore that internal distraction nail, but using a um, internal lengthening nail, we may lengthen for shorter uh, deficiencies. You can also shorten the longer leg as well. Um, but I think in terms of managing leg length discrepancies, I think one of the fair things to do uh, in these tests, if they start to talk about leg length discrepancies or calculating a deficiency or something like that, right? Knowing that boys grow to 16, girls grow to 14, you can use sort of the mathematic or arithmetic uh, arithmetic method to calculate a leg length discrepancy. But I think what helps is to actually draw out the ones that you're going to sort of use or contemplate on a, a you know, for your epiphysiodesis. And I think the common thing that happens is they may present either somebody has a growth arrest or had an infection at birth or neonatal infection, which shut down you know, a femur and they're still growing. And so when you go to calculate when you're going to do your epipsiodesis or something like that, know that that femur has already shut down. And so even if you shut down the other side, it's not going to change anything. It's still going to stay the same. You need to go to the tibia. So hopefully that makes sense. But it, you know, I think as they start to present it, think about what is actually working and what is not. Um, and then what can you slow down on the on the longer side to help you uh, achieve your your goal? All right. Uh, foot and ankle deformities. Um, I know Dr. Plowski's given his talk, uh, gave a nice one a couple months ago. 
but we went through uh, Clubfoot, uh, Ponsetti, good success in the order that you're going to correct, Cavus, Adductus, Varus, Aquinas. You're going to do the tenotomy. Um, then they're going in, into braces sometime until the age of, you know, in some series, four to five. But compliance with bracing helps with the prevention of uh, reoccurrence of the club foot deformity. All right. Um, we're not, I'm not going to go through sort of too much in terms of the operative treatment because I think a lot of this has, um, is a little bit historic because it really focuses on Ponsetti treatment. But the other treatment you have to know is the, for dynamic supination, the transfer of the complete, yeah, or a tendo, I'm sorry, a um, tibialis anterior tendon to the lateral cuneiform uh, may be done at age four to five. So they may present that a child is showing some dynamic supination, some hind foot varus walking on the lateral border of their foot what are you going to do? It's an anterior tib transfer to the lateral border of the foot. You can also recast kids uh, to help with, um, recast children to help with uh, recurrent deformities as well, even older kids, all right? Congenital vertical talus, how do you make this diagnosis, right? It's a maximum plantar flexion view, um, and that talus does not reduce on the navicular. You can do serial casting with or without a small medial telonavicular joint open reduction um, and pinning, or you can do a full open reduction um, of the uh, telonavicular joint as well. It may be associated with chromosomal abnormalities or something else going on, and so you know they may show you this and say, "What else should you get?" It may be a genetics consult. Um, <laughs> maybe a spine MRI, something like that, if you see some other um, abnormality. But uh, arthrogryposis, spina bifida, uh, diastata myomelia can also be another uh, um, condition. Um, child comes in for flat feet. Um, the treatment is usually uh, stretching, orthotics. It's not going to change the natural history, but um, you want to make sure is it rigid or not. If it's rigid, start to think about tarsal coalition, an untreated congenital or oblique vertical talus. If they have pain medially, do they have a uh, accessory navicular? Again, the treatment for any of these conditions of the tarsal coalition or accessory navicular would initially be a trial of conservative treatment, whether it's a walker boot or a cast before jumping to surgery, all right? The four-year-old, though, who comes in with a painful foot and an x-ray, look at the navicular. Maybe they have Kohler's disease, all right, which is flattening or an osteochondrosis of the foot there, all right? Um, for flat foot reconstruction, um, it is generally either lengthening the gastroc or um, tendo Achilles lengthening. You can do a Z-lengthening of the perineal uh, brevis tendon, and then you could do a lateral column lengthening or an Evans uh, calcaneal osteotomy um, and possibly a, a medial cuneiform uh, osteotomy because as you bring that foot around, it's going to be supinated and you have to um, get the foot back down. All right. Coalitions for rigid cl uh, club foot, calcaneal navicular are more common than the uh, talocalcaneal. All right. Um, I think this is the one that's, uh, and we even looked this up, and it's been two different references that say this, I, and I don't know how to guide you on this, of when you can do a resection with fat interposition for a uh, <coughs> talocalcaneal, and it's just 50% of the joint, is it 50% of a portion of the is it the middle and, and posterior facet? I forget what we found when we looked this up last year. Brian Scannell, Dr. Casey, uh, Doc, Dr. Pulowski, if he's still on. He is. Yeah. I yeah. can't remember what we found. I just remember what I do, which is of the facet. 50% of what facet? The middle facet? Yeah. But then it becomes yeah. So I, I, I can't 
I'll look back for it, try to send you a reference on this. But I, the, I got thrown off on this question, I know, when I took the OIT because I saw 50%, but it was only 50% of the post year for set. And that's not enough. It's got to be 50% of the joints. So it would have to involve at least the middle and then post year for set there. But if someone has a good answer, then let us know. But that's the treatment for, um, that'd be the treatment for uh, tarsal coalition for, for, of the talocalcaneal. For the calcaneal navicular, um, again, it's resection and then doing some interposition, either extensor digitorum brevis or some fat interposition there. Okay. Uh, CT scans and MRIs, you can have multiple coalitions and you can look at them in the other foot as well. All right. So this is Charcot Marie Tooth. Dr. Casey has runs a special on this in her clinic uh, with families. She diagnoses them all the time, so she knows that it's the peripheral myelin protein 22, so autosomal dominant uh, chromosome 17. Right? Um, where we see it in in patients is they may start to develop uh, uh, cavovarus foot deformity from perineal muscle atrophy. Um, but overpull of that perineal um, uh, longest tendon, or they got a plantar flex first ray in this cavus deformity. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on if it's rigid or not, you know, with a Coleman block test, you may decide to do soft tissue procedures with um, plantar fascial release, uh, uh, tendon transfers, um, versus doing um, a osteotomies. Um, uh, or of the forefoot and hind foot to correct this as well. So here is the varus. Um, here is that uh, correct where you have their heel under a block there. And so a rigid hind foot stays in varus. Um, and therefore you have to do something the calcaneus, uh, flexible. You can do forefoot osteotomy. You may have to do, like I said, the longest of brevis transfer as well. Um, uh, this is just sort of some, I guess, uh, in the terms of the foot deformities, where the where the muscles are, um, it, without sort of having typed this up. I don't. It, as going through it, it's sort of uh, your agonist and antagonist here, right? So for Aquinas, you have a strong gastroxoleus complex and weaker dorsiflexors, cavus is the intrinsics um, with weak, uh, counterposed by weak uh, dorsiflexors and you have a tight plantar fascia. If you're in varus, it may be posterior tib or anterior tib counterbalanced by the peroneus brevis, which is sort of what we see a little bit in the, um, a weak peroneus brevis in the um, um, Charcot-Marie tooth. <laughs> supination, where we see that in dynamic supination, where we see that in club foot, you gotta think about the tibialis anterior. Um, the equino varus and equino valgus, uh, either in the CP patients. So equino varus, thinking about their gastrox as well as their um, posterior tib and anterior tib, as well as equino valgus, where their foot is kicked out to the side, where they have active overactive perineals in the gastroc, and calcaneal valgus, where they're, uh, which you may see in sort of a Milo patient, where they have active foot dorsiflexors. So it's just sort of a, a summary there. Um, as you go through some toe door deformities, um, this bracket epiphysis for the uh, congenital hallux varus. So you have actually the physis that runs along the entire uh, length of the diaphysis. So from the um, from the epiphysis and down laterally there, or I'm sorry, immediately there, which will cause this. Um, Great toe, and so you got to do a pipsiolysis, excise that. Uh, syndactyly, don't operate on it. Polydactyly is common, especially post axial polydactyly. Um, curly toes, you can release them. Um, yeah, uh, uh, and then you can do a ray resection for some of these overgrowth syndromes as well. All right, so. Uh, it's almost seven o'clock. Pediatric hand. I don't know how much Dr. Um, Gaston covered in the pediatric yeah. hand section. Yeah, um, I feel like we've probably covered that. I know there is a section in the pediatric, um, or I mean, in the hand 
uh, OITE review. I would say in three minutes, if you want to blast through a few things with um, scoliosis there, um, or we can, if we all need to um, digest what we've heard, we can end it there, whatever you guys want to do. Um, yeah, I think I can go through the spine topics because I think there there's some topics that I can pull out that are high yield. I think for the syndromes and, and the other things that are on here, um, you really just sort of have to go through them and hear them and look at them a couple of times or I'm happy to try to do another night before then if, if folks need to. But for we can certainly go through the spine and I think there's some things. So um, the highlights from um, spine, um, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis being probably the most common diagnosis you would see you know, these red flags, which would be indications either for MRI or to think about something else are kyphotic because this is normally a hypokyphosis or lordosis. Um, you have rapid progression, an atypical sort of a left curve or a short angular curve or dystrophic curve, abnormalities on exam, you know, abdominal reflexes or, or foot abnormalities. So that would be reason to um, think about this. I think these are good uh, parameters to think about. So observing curves less than 25, 20 to 25 degrees, um, bracing curves that are between 20 and 45 degrees, and then surgery for more than 45 to 50. What is probably testable material now is stuff from the braced study. And so they didn't use bo hand bone age, but that's probably, you know, could be thrown in there as well. Um, you know, Sanders four below is would be considered skeletally immature, um, but they use Risser sign um, or being less than one year postmenarchal. So if you have at least more than two years of growth remaining, what the take home from the brace study was is that it, with a TLSO brace, not a nighttime bending, but a, a, a TLSO brace, that's 16 hours, at least 16 hours, seem to be the magic number to prevent curve progression for an indication for surgery, but still one out of four patients, um, so, uh, one out of four patients who gets braced still can progress onto surgery. So I think the 16 hours seems to be the cutoff and then one out of four patients can uh, still progress in their intention to treat. Okay. Um, so risks or signs, understanding what those are. Um, this is, showing some signs of the skeletal maturity, but this is this RUS, but Sanders really just looked at the phalangeal physis um, to come up with his. And this is, um, I believe, the, the sort of the demiglio um, or um, Savion with looking at the elbow as well um, as skeletal markers of maturity. Uh, probably not gonna test you specifically on the ins and outs of the lanky classification, um, but understanding, you know, that there are structural and non-structural curves, structural curves being ones that are um, either have greater than 20 degrees of kyphosis or greater than uh, 25 degrees still remaining on bending x-rays there. And so if it bends out uh, then it's a non-structural curve there. Um, and then these can sort of help determine which curves need to be fused. Um, talk about stable vertebrae. Um, uh, um, I, I, I don't know, Mike or Brian, anything else you would add to uh, Lanky here? I, I really think it's the compensatory curves that they would do. Yeah, uh, and, and the, the, bending out, the bending criteria. What, say that again? Uh, the bending criteria. Yeah. So it's structural, non structural. Yeah. Um, yeah. Less so than 25 degrees less side than, bending. Less than 25 degrees, yeah. And so, you know, treatment is generally a posterior spinal fusion. I don't know that, um, you know, uh, they may show you an AIS with a left sided curve, you know, MRI. And so these are the types of braces. Um, this is, no one's really doing a CTLSO for these upper thoracic curves there. All right, congenital scoliosis, failures of formation or segmentation. Um, think about intracardiac, I'm sorry, cardiac and renal abnormalities. Um, and also, if you're going to operate, you need to get an MRI pre-op to make sure there's no intraspinal pathology. Um, they don't really respond. Their 
the primary curve doesn't really respond to casting or bracing their compensatory or secondary curve may all right classification is usually early onset great less than five years of age or these infantile um, versus juvenile is sort of in that uh, five to nine range right um, I don't know if they're going to ask anything they could ask on meta casting um, you know curves that um, for the infantile scoliosis you can do meta casting to try to help with prevention of progression and start to even uh, uh, get that to resolve some and so either rib phases which is overlapping ribs over the um, vertebral body and pedicle versus the rib vertebral angle difference of greater than um, of 20 uh, being predictors of progression um, if you have um, uh, you know, if you have a progressive curve, getting an MRI, looking for other issues, um, cafe au lait spots, um, or some other changes may represent um, neurofibromatosis. So, getting an MRI to look at this as well. And so, you know, the serial casting is generally indicated when these curves get up over 30 degrees. So, almost the same type for bracing. And then, surgery may be reserved for those kids that are greater than 50 to 60 degrees. All right. Um, crankshaft phenomena. This is when you have uh, anterior growth after you've had a posterior fusion. Um, the th thought is that if you do the a fusion after their triradiate are closed, you have less of a chance of this. Or with three column fixation with pedicle screws, the thought is that that, that risk is is uh, less. Dystrophic curves are short angular curves. You would see these with penciling of the ribs. Um, or and uh, in a neurofibromatosis case, so they're short, sharp curves, right? Um, we talked a little bit about cerebral palsy and scoliosis, you know, fusing to the pelvis. Uh, they have different curves. Um, this is talking about pediatric spondylolysis or spondylolisthesis. Again, the treatment is rest, exercise, uh, hamstring stretching, core strengthening, even bracing. Um, to help with this, not surgery, unless they ha are having some neurological deficits and a high-grade spondylolisthesis. All right. Uh, this is talking about pelvic tilt, uh, sac uh, uh, pelvic incidence, pelvic tilt, sacral slope, um, and looking at these different parameters. Um, that's a little bit more than what we go into for an OIT review there. Um, and then kyphosis, we have Schuerman's kyphosis where you have anterior wedging of more than five degrees over three consecutive levels. Um, uh, typical in the thoracic spine, you may have pain if it's happening in the thoracal lumbar junction where you should be fairly neutral or in the lumbar spine where you should be lordotic. Again, um, some postural stretching can help with this. You can brace if the curves are getting larger than, you know, 50 or 60 to 80 degrees and then with larger curves greater than 90 degrees in pain you may think about surgery for them um, but again in, in many of the pediatric questions it's the first line treatment would be you know observation you're not going to jump to surgery um, unless there's some red flag or something like that that's going to dictate you to get a, a MRI or some other study you know you may see echocardiogram if you see congenital scoliosis or congenital kyphosis there. Uh, congenital kyphosis um, may be associated with clipophile and you know if they have a um, failure formation they may have a progressive um, deformity that's going to require uh, surgery there. Um, discitis, uh, you'll see loss of lordosis, narrowing of the end plate. I've never seen this um, but the treatment is antibiotics. Maybe it has seen me but I've never seen it. Um, and then anterior, I'm sorry, uh, spines, who will progress? If you're skeletally mature, immature, or you have a curve greater than 50 degrees in the thoracic spine, greater than 40 or 45 in the lumbar spine, um, uh, males more than females, females have more scoli uh, have scoliosis higher rates than males do, neuromuscular curves, and then immature as well, all right? So AIS has a right thoracic, left lumbar pattern commonly. CP has these long C-shaped 
the neurofibromatosis has these sharp, 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 short dystrophic curves. Um, you know, neuromuscular curves can have it, uh, can have a, a sort of that C-shaped curve as well. And then these olesthetic curves are sort of driven by pain. You may see those with spondies or spondylolysis or spondylolisthesis there. All right. Um, clepophile fusion of cervical spine may be associated with a Sprengel's deformity. Um, is congenital muscular torticollis, most common cause. Um, it's almost like an intrauterine uh, compartment syndrome, whether you get a uh, contracture of the sternocleidomastoid. So the head is tilted and towards the uh, tight SCM and the head is rotated away. But if you start to develop torticollis older, think of atlantoaxial rotatory subluxation if you've had some minor trauma or a little infection, or if you've had, uh, or if you're starting to develop, think of some ocular problem um, uh, or a posterior fossa tumor. All right. And the first, and the young kids though, stretching, stretching, and stretching is the, the treatment. All right. Uh, gristles is an acute, or uh, not UTI, but uh, respiratory tract infection or upper respiratory tract infection, and you start to develop some torticollis or acute uh, rotatory uh, subluxation. So soft collar, anti-inflammatories, maybe even some muscle relaxants. All right. And I think that's it for tonight. All right. Did we get through most of the high stuff? As we go through this, I think our, our lectures are designed over the years to 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 go through this. But like I said, for those who join later, if you want to hear it presented a little bit different way, um, Dan Miller from uh, uh, Minnesota and Gillette Children's has a couple on the POSNA Academy and POSNA website that have been well received and he's done a good job and gone through some of those questions as well. And so um, uh, I, I think that's another resource. Or if you're on PEDS this month, Kelsey and, and Nick and Michael, if you um, want to talk about any of those during clinic, that'd be great. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Brighton. All right. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Nice job, Brian. Thank you. Get some water now. Yeah. None of, no, my, none of my kids brought me anything. Get something that's not water now. Uh, I'm on call. Uh, drink some lemonade. <laughs> yeah. Maybe just one. Operating on your kid after one drink? Yes, to get that shake out of your hands, you know. <laughs>